So by whale, 20 men, three boats, 96 days is our uh, exhibition, new exhibition for this season. Um, and it's gonna run for two seasons. Uh, as some of you may have heard being on the island, there is a small little cinema piece coming out later in the year um, that looks at the Essex whale ship tragedy. And we have decided to take advantage of that opportunity to do uh, some new historical work on the, the tragedy, to do a display about it. And it has fallen to me since I arrived last summer to figure out what sort of shape this kind of exhibition would take. And, you know, we are a logical place to have this kind of exhibition. Uh, as I'm fond of saying, as, as my coworkers are probably tired of hearing me say, the Nantucket Whaling Museum holds all of the surviving objects from this tragedy, both of them. <laughs> and let me show you what the, actually I was gonna tell you a little bit about. Any, has anybody not heard of the Essex or know what happened? <laughs> Essex was stove by a whale. <laughs> In 1820, November 20th, 1820, uh, while whaling, while all the men were out in the whale boats, a uh, few of them had come back to make some repairs. A whale struck the whale ship Essex twice. Uh, it rolled over and flooded and was destroyed, was wrecked. And uh, two days later, the crew decided they would sail their way to South America. Uh, this is a somewhat fanciful depiction. Um, since it's not quite a sperm whale and none of the boats were actually destroyed in the event. But the depiction of the Essex going over is pretty good. Um, this is one of the survivor sketches of them in three whale boats um, heading away on their journey. Uh, three of the men decided to stay on an island where they had all stopped for a week uh, and they were later rescued by, uh, by a passing ship. But anyway, two objects, we have two objects from this. We have Benjamin Lawrence's twine that he made and kept with him when he was in the boat. Um, it says, written in this card, um, was in the boat 93 days and made this two and a half inch long piece of twine. It was actually in the boat a bit less than 93 days because they stopped on Henderson Island for a week, but that's okay, still a big deal. And then we have this trunk. Uh, this trunk uh, was handed down in the family of, um, of a mariner uh, whose family was in Ohio and it came to the NHA uh, in the 1890s. Um, this was pulled out of the sea near where the Essex was wrecked. It was believed to be from the wreck by the people who picked it up. Um, and sort of, we don't know whether it's really from the wreck, we don't know whose it might have been, but it has a lot of power as it's always been traditionally associated with it. Um, and we, we hold this. Oh, a third object, we actually have three. Uh, so we have a survivor of Thomas Nickerson's manuscript account of the disaster. Uh, there are two primary sources on the disaster. Um, first mate Owen Chase, of course, published a book within a few months of returning to Nantucket. Uh, his manuscript does not survive that we know of, but there are, of course, first printings of his narrative. We hold some of those in the library here. Thomas Nickerson, who was 14 years old when the ship sailed uh, from Nantucket, wrote this account in the 1860s um, based on his own recollections, but he also had a copy of Chase's narrative on his desk and then filled in details as he clearly followed along from that. In the 1870s, he mailed this to an author, um, of a sort of popular author of adventure stories who he was hoping would turn it into better prose and get it published. Uh, that author who has a fascinating story about fleeing town and mistresses and all this kind of stuff, um, did all that before this could get published and turned into anything. This went into a family attic and was rediscovered in the 80s and made its way here, uh, largely through the efforts of Edward Stackpole. So we have this incredible documentation, but that's it. And so how do you do an exhibition based on these three things? Well, you start looking a little closer in your collection. And it turns out we have more than just two, two things related to this. You know, we may only have one thing that came off the boat and one thing that might have come up off the ship, but we have other things. The, the, the piece in the middle in the top row is the title page of Owen Chase's narrative. We have a number of copies of that. We have some pretty interesting copies with annotations in the margins and things like this. Um, the ladle on the one side, this was a gift from the crew of the Essex to the previous captain, Daniel Russell, as a token of esteem when the ship returned to Nantucket in April of 1819 a few months before heading on its final voyage. Um, we also have um, a wharf book from that very voyage that says what the return of oil was and how much was paid to every crew member. It has the signed receipts um, from every crew member with that they received their portion. And many of those same men 
sailed on the final voyage of the ship. And so you see a lot of their names signed in it. Uh, that's the book that's down here in the corner. Uh, we have Owen Chase's eyeglasses case and some other mementos of, these, of the survivors of their subsequent lives. This is dated 1847. So, you know, he went on and had, did other things in his life. And then the shipping paper, this is a crew list from 1817, one of the previous voyages. Uh, the Essex was 20 years old by the time it went on its final voyage. Uh, it had gone on, this was its seventh, if I, I believe I'm correct on that, um, whaling voyage. It had been a commercial um, carrier before that. Um, so we have, we have other things to show. We have a model that um, Mark Sutherland, a local uh, some summer resident, uh, made for us a few years ago um, based on really good research. Um, truth be told, no one really knows what the Essex exactly looked like. There's no half model or, or any offsets that survive. Um, but Mark did some really astonishing research on this in period documents, the original registry papers, um, a lot of deep knowledge of whaling ships and how they operated to create to create this very close approximation of what a working whale ship of Essex's type would have been like. Um, so we have this, obviously. And then we have, you know, we are the Nantucket Whaling Museum. And as you can see by looking around this room, we have a lot of depictions of whaling at this very period. Um, and these three paintings, for instance, are among, you know, the chief things that we have to talk about whaling at this period. These are all depictions of the whale ship Spermo, which made its only whaling voyage out of Nantucket, um, in 1820, 1821, 22. And the top two paintings are in our collection, and the lower painting uh, is being lent to us from a private collection for this exhibition. Um, there are, the, the, the paintings are believed are, are by a, are an artist named Fisher. Um, we don't know very much about him. Um, there are six known canvases by him. Uh, four of them the NHA owns, two of them are on the back wall here, two are now upstairs. This one was discovered, well, we didn't, People who owned it didn't discover it. They'd had it for many, many years. But there was a connection made with us a few years ago, and we realized that it was another one of these paintings. These all depict. These are all very early oil painting depictions of a Nantucket whale ship out whaling in the Pacific. So they're very important artifacts, but they also help us to tell a story about whaling. And you know, the story of the Essex. What is the Essex doing out there? It's doing this. But then you start broadening your search. You know, okay, I want to do an exhibition based on how many objects we're up to now, or five or six. Um, you look at, you know, what do we have as context? Where did the Essex come from? Who are the people on board? What sort of families did they come from? And I started looking very closely in our collection for objects that we had from 1819, 1820. Just what do we have? And it turns out we have quite a bit. We have a lot of stuff dated to that period. Um, we probably have a lot more that is from that period, but it's not yet dated in our collection. Um, but I went with what we knew, knew about. Um, here are some representations of actual people who lived on Nantucket at the time the Essex sailed. Um, and we have these, these depictions of them. I will not remember all of their names just at the moment. But our lovely Quaker woman in the upper corner, um, she was 60 years old at this time um, and is there in her lovely rocking chair. Uh, we have Arthur Cooper, um, who came here, um, helped found uh, the Zion AME Church. Um, we have a very nice portrait of him. Um, we have a uh, Sea Captain's wife and their two daughters, other people in the audience will be able to remember who the names are at the moment. We have um, Mrs. Plaskett in silhouette. Uh, her husband is also available to us in silhouette. Uh, they were living here at the time. Captain Burdett, who was one of the people who discovered Antarctica, the complicated story. Um, we've been able to, we have a, a portrait of, a made available for the show of him, which is very nice. And then Simeon Russell, the Cooper, um, who actually passed away not long after this was this image was made in 1819. Um, and so all these people sort of represent different currents of the population of Nantucket at the time. You know, it's this major seaport. It makes its living based on whaling and based on coastal trade. But there's a lot of other people here. There are people who are in business. There are people, you know, the Coopers who are making things, the ironmongers who are making things, all this, the families, all of this, a very rich and diverse group of people beyond just sailors and whale oil merchants. And so we had a really, we have a really good representation of them. We have those things to display, pulled those out. And then digging a little deeper, it turns out we have all kinds of stuff, really exciting things. We have samplers dated from 1820. We have Peleg Macy's fire bucket from 1818, sort of showing efforts on the island to prevent fire, such as they were at the time. Uh, Walter Folger Jr., um, famous uh, man about town. That may not be the right description of him, but um, polymat might be the better word. Um, you know, sometimes represented um, Nantucket um, 
in government, and he was an astronomer, made his own instruments. He was also a nautical instrument maker. This uh, telescope was finished um, just about the time the Essex sailed. Uh, it was used to observe a, a comet a few years later. Really nice object. We, um, the, um, the sort of weird cast iron object is one of the stair brackets from the Great Point Lighthouse, uh, which the second lighthouse was completed in 1818. Um, was then destroyed in the 18, in 1980s and since rebuilt, but we have things like that. Uh, we have the first book published on Nantucket, 1817, epitome of bookkeeping by single entry, very exciting. Um, but a very significant sort of thing that there, you know, there would be publishing here on the island. Um, and so all of the stuff here, are, these are all things, you know, the material culture of the island at the very time the Essex is going. So we start to have things that would, are worth showing and worth, you know, sort of coming to an exhibition for widening the circle, you know, what is the Essex doing? The Essex is going out into the Pacific, it's hunting whales, it, it's gonna try and get home if something bad doesn't happen to it. And we have a lot of artifacts as a maritime museum about navigation, getting around the world, about Nantucketers going out into the Pacific, bringing home mementos, souvenirs, and things that represent the cultures that they meet. And, you know, we, here is a selection of some of the material that I've picked for the exhibition. Um, you know, compasses, the compass in fact is made by Walter Folger, who made the telescope you saw in the previous, uh, previous slide. Um, we have Obed Starbe Starbucks um, telescope. Uh, he was uh, mate on a, on, a, on a whaler at this very time that was raided by pirates. Um, so that had, this is from his next voyage, but you know, still pretty good. Um, a Galapagos tortoise, lots of whalers stopped at the Galapagos Islands to pick up the giant tortoises. Uh, which they used for food. Um, they believed, you know, they didn't need to be fed, and they'd live forever, and we can just eat them fresh whenever. They actually probably starved to death, but um, well, the sailors didn't mind that so much. The Essex went and picked up hundreds of these, uh, and this is, a, this is a tortoise shell brought back to Nantucket in the 19th century that was in the, the Athenaeum's collection, is now in our collection. Uh, the Mariah Mitchell has a very similar one. That's an that's a important attraction of the house if you go tour the Mariah Mitchell house. Um, and then uh, the, the two clubs at the bottom, the, 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 the one is an uwu club from the Marquesas Islands. We have two of these in the collection. And the lower one is a chieftain staff uh, with human hair at the top. Um, really powerful objects from um, Marquesan culture. And we start to see you know, stories that we can tell about whalers' encounters with the people in the Pacific by looking at these kinds of objects. And so I'm sort of tracing out, like, how do you develop and like, how do you create enough material for an exhibition? And you just keep working your way out in layers and seeing what you have. And one of the layers with the Essex story is that everybody knows of its connections to Moby Dick. And so what do we have? We're a whaling museum. People give us copies of Moby Dick and give us copies of things related to Melville. And you'll see quotes from Melville and Moby Dick all over the museum. You know, clearly there's a lot of resonance here. Um, so I went to look at some of those. The, the, the lower object, a fantastic poster from the 1950s representing the voyage of the Pequod, um, going its way around the Cape of Good Hope, off through the Indian Ocean, out to the Pacific, with the track gradu gradually getting redder and redder as it goes. Um, really fantastic stuff. Um, Mocha Dick, the, 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 the name of Moby Dick, comes from this albino whale uh, that actually existed. Uh, and was published about uh, in one major account. Um, this is a later 1870s publication of the same account, which just has this fantastic cover to it. Um, our little white whale, um, you know, if you, if you carve whales out of ivory, they end up being white. So it's fairly, you know, interesting there. And then we have a lot of books published about the Essex. Lots of people have tried to tell this story, have told it in different ways. Uh, the Loss of the Essex um, book that's here is by, was by Edward Stackpole. Um, when he first wrote this in 1935, he was already associated with the NHA, um, but he also was a reporter for the Inquirer and Mirror. The Inquirer and Mirror published at that time a series of short little books about important um, or interesting Nantucket historical topics, and they published this one. Uh, it's all of, you know, 25 pages. It does not have Edward Stackpole's name in it yet because it was just the newspaper publishing it. It was reprinted many times, and his name then subsequently appeared. Um, and the thrilling whaling voyage in poetry, this is the whale ship Dauphin, which sailed from Nantucket after the Essex, but was out in, in, in the ocean time. It rescued Captain Pollard and his boat. Um, and the, the, one of the crewmen here, the third mate, recorded the entire voyage of the Dauphin in poetry. Not great poetry, but the whole thing's there. And the key part of it, or four stanzas, about them picking up Captain Pollard and um, Charles Ramsdell and 
sort of alluding to what had happened in the boats in a very delicate way, and then that's the event that appears on the cover. So this is another one of these depictions of the, you can, if you can kind of see, imagine the whale there. Um, so we have this kind, of, this kind of phenomenal stuff, and then as it just so happens, that little Hollywood production that everybody's heard a little bit about, they said to us, maybe we can make some stuff available. And um, with a lot of reminding and cajoling and a lot of diplomatic work on, the, on, on our staff, uh, really good effort here, they made available to us filming props and costumes from, from the production, uh, of which I've picked just two as a sample. Um, the life-size whale eye, uh, which we really love, is really powerful. Um, and although you cannot do this in the exhibition, in, when they were filming, there are two ropes behind the eye and you can move the eye around. Um, Really fun. Um, and then this here, uh, this is one of my favorite things that they've made available to us, and it is this box of tools for making Scrimshaw with samples of Scrimshaw, well, Scrimshaw. Um, and it's assigned to the character. They've got it here misprinted as um, Kellogg Chapel. It's Thomas Chapel. I don't actually know which way his name goes in the movie. I think it's actually Thomas, um, but we'll wait until December to find out. What is really fascinating about this is that, you know, major Hollywood production about whaling, what are the key things you want to see when, when you, there's whaling involved? You're going to see whales, you're going to see harpoons, you're going to see some blood and gore, you're going to see Scrimshaw. But actually the Essex story is too early for that. Scrimshaw is just beginning to spread through whaling ships at this time. It is highly unlikely that any of the crewmen of the Essex are doing Scrimshaw or doing a lot of it. Um, and so to have one of the boat steers of the ship have this whole set is completely anachronistic. Um, but really fascinating, you know, that the imperatives of Hollywood and the imperatives of, of being truthful to history don't always line up, and that's totally fine, um, because, it, you know, somebody went to a lot of effort to create these props. These are all resin, none of this is ivory. Um, you know, they drew things on it, and they did the tooth with the woman, and, you know, these tools and things are really, really a lot of fun. Um, so we're very happy to have those kinds of things. So th with those kinds, uh, that sort of toolkit of real stuff, you know, I believe that as a museum we should be displaying real stuff that tells real stories. Um, then it just falls to figure out, well, how do you put it into a gallery? What do you do with it? And how do you tell a story that's worth being on your feet, walking through it for the length of your visit? Um, we work with a very talented uh, design team, um, Helen Regal, um, who runs uh, her design out of Marblehead. Um, here in Massachusetts, and uh, Matt Kirkman, who runs Object Idea, uh, which is a sort of uh, exhibition development firm. Uh, Helen was with us f uh, throughout the entire project, did all the graphic design, and Matt helped, came, and came and went in order to help us conceptualize things, very much a team effort. Um, they helped me, you know, they sat down with me, I'm the historian, I say, well, this is the most important kernels of historical truth I want to communicate. And then they would say, well, what if we did this? What if it looked like this? And I'd say, oh, that sends the wrong message, or that's perfect, let's do that. And you collaborate and you come up with a floor plan that works with graphics that work and move forward from there. This is what our, basically our attraction is when you walk up onto the mezzanine. Um, we've done these large graphics, hopefully conveying that our story is about an encounter between a ship and a whale. And that's sort of the basic thing to know as you go forward. And then you lay in the largest objects that you've identified first and you fit everything else around it. So this is a, a representation of the first wall that you encounter in the exhibition. Uh, and you won't be able to read the text, but the, the, the large panels at the, at the left and in the middle um, say Nantucket 1819 and the Whale Ship Essex. These are our first two sections where we lay out the sort of where did these people come from, what, what is the historical context, and all those wonderful things that I was finding from the collection are laid in here with the, the, um, uh, the telescope forming an you know, important sort of moment. Uh, to draw you into the gallery. We've brought up one of the tripods that was sitting here. We've taken that up. Um, that's always a walk in the park, moving those around. Um, you know, portraits, sort of assembling these things together. And then this wall faces another wall that's the South Pacific, where I've taken the various things that I was showing you and structured it into, you know, what did Nantucketers know about getting to the Pacific? Where did they habitually go at this time? What were the limits on their knowledge? Because this is a period when there are parts of the Pacific that whalers are starting to go into, starting to see if they can find whales there. And their knowledge of how to get there and get back and where to hunt is growing very quickly. Um, and the Essex, in fact, had headed to the offshore ground, which had only been exploited for about the last two years by the time it's there. Um, 
And one of the fascinating details you know, with the Essex story is that Captain Pollard knew how to navigate by dead reckoning, and he could find latitude, but he couldn't find longitude. He didn't know the, the procedure at the time of, find, of you know, finding a lunar, obser making a lunar observation. And he was not unusual in that at all. He didn't carry a chronometer. He couldn't afford one. Most whalers didn't. Um, and you kind of imagine, like imagine any of you hopping in a boat out here in the harbor, and you're not going to have a watch with you, and you're not going to know one of the key pieces of how to find your place on a grid, but you're going to sail the Pacific anyway to hunt the biggest creatures on Earth. That's what they're doing, you know, and and that's pretty powerful. And so I'm sort of using objects to layer in those kinds of stories. And then we have, you know, we have some harpoons and some things that you expect to see. Just like Hollywood, we will give you things you expect to see. Um, but then we take our Marquesan objects and we use this as an opportunity to talk about what these particular Nantucketers knew or didn't know about the places they could go in the Pacific. You know, as most of you will know, the Essex crew had a choice. They could have sailed with the wind about 1,200 miles or so, and reached islands. And if they had done so, they probably all would have survived. But they decided not to, because they were fearful of what they would encounter there and how they would be met by those people. They knew the coast of South America. They knew what to expect there and the people they would encounter. And they decided to go there, against the wind, a much longer voyage. And I think this is one of the key things about this, about this is that the men of the Essex were not lost, although they could have been better equipped with navigation. They weren't stranded. They weren't helpless. They were professional mariners in their boats dealing with the situation. They had choices. They made one. And they were outmatched by the situation. Um, but they had agency to do it. If any of us were cast into a whaleboat in the middle of the Pacific, I don't know that any of us could really know where to go and figure it out. Um, and I hope none of us would decide to go the long way. But those are some of the stories and some of the things, you know, in reading through the story and trying to figure out what to say in the exhibition, what to say, have the objects help us communicate? These are some of the ideas that I've, I've sort of come across. Um, but also, you know, looking at the Essex, the Essex tragedy, what are the key core aspects of this story? And working with, you know, my colleagues on the design team, also working very closely with uh, Betsy Tyler here on our staff, I, you know, we came up to the conclusion that the, the two key aspects of the story we wanted to communicate were that there is a boat journey involved that was conditioned by certain choices and had certain outcomes, and that there were real men involved who made these choices and were in this situation. So to communicate their stories, we built a boat. No Nantucket whale boats survive from this period. All the surviving original whale boats are all New Bedford examples like this one. Um, which New Bedford boats did come here later in whaling. This one was, certain, was probably used here. We're still trying to learn a lot more about this boat. Um, but the earlier boats, when some of the construction techniques were different, before they had sails routinely, when they were just rowing boats, were different. And we don't know all the details of that. But we know enough about size to do a simulation of one of these boats, to give the sense of, you, know, you and your 19 colleagues have just had this happen to your mothership. You're in a boat. What is that like? And we built this boat where it's complete on one side. It's 20 feet long, which the range of, of lengths for boats that the Essex would have had is about 20 to 25 feet. So we've, we've done that. Um, and then we cut away the other side of the boat so that you can sit in it without actually having to climb over the walls. Um, and if you're in a wheelchair or if you have a stroller, you can push yourself, get yourself into the back of the boat and have the same experience. We are claiming this is the world's first ADA compliant whale boat even if it won't actually float in the harbor. Um, so what we did was we you know, created this boat, and we put it into as much of a watery environment as a museum can do. We have big murals. We have a lot of waves. We have a lot of things evoking the sea. And we invite you to sit in the boat and think about being 1,200 miles from anywhere. And what are you going to do? How do you do it? This, in fact, can, I don't know if any of you can see, the tiny little yellow dot in the middle of this picture, this is where the Essex was destroyed. And they decide to go the long way. So we put this in the show with this, with the boat, and then with other elements. This is very much, this is a, this is, there are some images of this disaster, but there aren't any contemporary images. There's certainly no photographs from the boats. Um, unlike like World War II disasters where you actually have people taking cameras with them. Um, so we pulled out a lot of material from the surviving narratives, from a few other sources, and we've layered that around to give a sense of what is going on, what these people thought about it, what they recorded about it. Um, 
title of the show comes from these lines between Captain Pollard and First Mate Chase about what has happened, um, and then some of some of Chase's feelings about this. There's a lot of banners, a lot of quotes, um, and these are all visible when you're sitting in the boat. Um, through a wonderful bit of research and sleuthing, um, Betsy was able to assemble together what we believe was in each of the boats based on the accounts. So not only how many men were there, but which sea chests did they seem to have rescued, which boats did they put them in, where did they put the navigational things. And you get a sense, you know, it's not just these men in the boats, they, they spend two days at this wreck pulling out as much supplies as they can take. And it's not that they didn't have enough water or enough bread, they could only carry so much water and so much bread in these boats, with the boats also carrying six or seven men and nails and firearms and all of the equipment that were there. You know, they were constrained by the physicality of these, of these boats. You also start to see, by looking at this, and I invite you when the show opens to come and take a closer look at a version you can actually read, um, you see that Captain Pollard surrounds himself with mostly Nantucketers in his boat. Um, and that Chase gets the rest of the Nantucketers, and second mate Joy gets no Nantucketers. And you see that there are class and locality prejudices playing out in these boats. Um, the navigational equipment, based on most accounts, um, they only had two compasses. There is a, a one reference that says they had three, um, but most of the accounts say that they only had two. Those go into the captain's boat, the first mate's boat. The, the second mate's boat has no navigational equipment. So if it gets separated, well, that's the end of them, probably. And that's, in fact, what happens. So we, you know, we sort of assembled some of this stuff together. We put it with our quotes and our, our desperate globe and the water, and you really start to get a picture of what, uh, some little glimmering of what was, what was going on here and what this was like. Then the other aspect of this is about journey. So how do we do a journey? Well, this is the floor plan of the gallery, and we've actually done a floor path that is sort of a timeline on the floor that starts over here, you may not be able to see it, but it does say one, where the Essex departs Nantucket in our story, it goes up our South Pacific wall, goes around, the whale comes in and goes out, and then we get the entire journey. And this journey, there are all these dots, and the dots are like this, and they give highlights of what happens, both in the Essex's voyage and then in the boats. And then the path comes to, the, to, comes to these six platforms. You can, you can see this overhead view. Um, there are these squares drawn in. These are all um, our so-called island platforms. And at each of these, we decided to talk more in depth about key ideas about this boat journey. You know, these men don't have enough food. What are the ramifications of that? How do they decide where to go? What's that about? Um, you know, very famous in the story, there's cannibalism involved. And in, in Captain Pollard's boat, they draw lots and they actually murder one of their, one of their um, crewmates. And so we talk about that. We, we address that. Um, you know, because that's part of the story. It's truth to this. Um, and we have objects picked out to represent those things. So you have a journey in a boat, in a gallery. The other aspect is who were these real men? You know, Chase gets a lot of, a lot of press, um, not just because he's being played by Chris Hemsworth in a new movie, but he writes the first account, and he's a sort of classic figure in this. Um, but there are 20 men involved. 21 men sail, one deserts um, in South America, so it's 20 men involved. We dug up as much information as we could find about their actual biographies. We've summarized it on a, on a panel. Um, and then we invite all of our visitors to pick up a card. And we've printed up cards um, for um, all the crew. You pick one up, it gives you a bit of a biography for it. You can sort of, if you want, assume that personality as you walk through the show. And at various points in the show, we have little card readers, little card slots, and you flip your card over and it has all 20 men listed, and you put it in, and a question is asked about that stage in the journey, and you get to see if the person who's on the front of your card, in fact, took part in whatever these things are that we've picked out. So it's a bit of trying to personalize and humanize these men. We don't have any contemporary depictions of them. Um, there, there is a portrait of Chase um, from about this time. It's in a private collection. Um, but we don't have, you know, we have pictures of these men as old men or we don't have any at all. And we wanted to give them some reality. And this was one of our devices to do that. And you go around the show and at the end of the show, our crew panel comes back. But this time, instead of telling us at the top how many white crew are there, how many Nantucket crew are there, we say, 
who survived, how many survive, how many don't survive. And then on the panel, it doesn't show up so well in the slide, but you know, the people who don't survive are grayed out. So you can, you can you know, take a look at this and see what actually happened to these people. Um, so those are sort of the two key elements of this that we thought were really important to communicate. We, we spent a lot of effort designing around um, aspects of showing that. Uh, there then is a subsequent story. Um, eight people survive. Five of them are from Nantucket. Three of them are not from Nant Nantucket. The five people who survive in the boats are all Nantucketers. The non-Nantucketers who survive are the three who decided to stay on Henderson Island. Um, and although the subtitle of the show includes the number 96 days, that's the length between the, the wreck and the last boat being picked up, if you count the three men being picked up off the island, that's 141 days. So a really long span of time for this all to play out. But we have objects from the subsequent lives of some of the Nantucket survivors. We, we've, we have some of those on display. We have these wonderful glass plate negative portraits of Owen Chase on the one side, Thomas Nickerson on the other. We also have a portrait of Benjamin Lawrence, which is displayed in the case that we have. Uh, and we've also been fortunate to continue on loan a number of objects brought up from the wreck of the two brothers, which was Captain Pollard's subsequent command, which also came to grief by striking a reef, um, which ended his career. At sea, he then came back to the island, uh, worked in a grocery. We know that he was one of the town watchmen. Um, so quite a quite a long life here. Uh, they all seem to have had long lives, and all of the other crewmen who survived became sea captains and stayed at sea. So we wanted to explore some of that. And then we have this movie. We have these movie props and other ideas, and Moby Dick needs to make an appearance. So we have a, the, the final ex part of the exhibition are objects that represent Moby Dick. Um, and uh, represent more Melville's encounter with the Essex story and incorporating that into Moby Dick. Um, and then our, our props from the movie. Um, this is a little bit cryptic because it's a slightly earlier iteration of the, of the design, but um, we've borrowed a number of um, Rockwell Kent's proof illustrations from the 1930 um, Lakeside edition of Moby Dick, which are framed on the wall, um, and one of which forms uh, this this nautical backdrop. Uh, so we've sort of left from Nantucket at the beginning of the show and we come back to a safe harbor at the end of the show, metaphorically, um, and we have our movie props and costumes. Um, and we're very happy to be presenting the embodiment of Owen Chase and the embodiment of Captain Pollard as represented by Hollywood's best costume designers um, and come back on Friday to see those because I don't have a picture of them. But that's pretty much that's pretty much it. That's pretty much how do you how do you start from two objects and work your way out to a thousand square foot show? Um, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. And if you do have any questions, just throw up a hand and I'll come over with the mic so everybody can hear. Was the composition of the boats that left the wreck? different from the composition of the boats that would go out hunting the whales? We tried to determine that. We tried to figure out who, who the standard boat crews were in each boat. And we, we felt very confident that each officer's boat steerer, would, they were all together and stayed together. We suspect that part of the boat composition did also remain the same, but we don't know enough about who the idlers were. Um, so the cook, Cooper, the carpenter, um, you know, the, um, the steward. We know who the steward was. Um, we do know from other whaling voyages that often the cooper and carpenter doubled up and so weren't necessarily idlers but could have been. Um, so we don't know exactly who might have stayed on the Essex when the three boats went out hunting whales to know which ones then had to be accommodated in one of the boats. Um, so we think that there's a lot of overlap that probably um, you know, Captain Pollard surrounded himself by himself by by Nantucketers in his boat, but it's clear that he ends up with all the young Nantucketers in his boat, sort of under his wing. And it's probably not the case that they were all part of his six-man crew when hunting whales. That wouldn't have been sufficient power to, to do that. So it's a little unclear, um, but we we do know at least some of it lines up. I have a, I have a sh short version that I tell about the. Um, the Nantucketers having to survive on first um, the people that died when they had to survive on the black crew and they had to survive on the off-islanders all before they survived on themselves. 
I noticed that in the, in the quiz bowl, when we talked about this disaster, and even here today, you kind of, are you skipping around to cannibalism a little bit? And what's the backstory with the NHA? How did you guys talk about how you would address? Yeah, that's a very good question. What we've done in the exhibition is we've actually put a panel up about cannibalism and about the sort of historical context for cannibalism. If you read the surviving accounts just straight, people die, they're eaten. They die, they're eaten. In the one boat, they get desperate, they kill somebody. And the other boat, just people die and they're eaten. That's what's literally said in the accounts. We don't have anything to countervene that in the accounts. But if you do read them closely, it is true. The black crew seem to die first. The off-islanders die first, generally. I mean, the first person to die is Matthew Joy, the second mate, who probably has tuberculosis um, and is ill. But the next people who die are all off-islanders or they're black. And that could be a coincidence, but it could not be a coincidence. Um, it is entirely possible that other people might have been murdered. We don't know, but when you do line it up, other possible narratives emerge. And looking at the historical record at how common cannibalism was in in desperate situations of this kind. Um, it is almost always the case that when they draw lots, the likely person is the one who draws the short straw. The youngest one, the person who's black. I mean, it, there's, there's like, you look, you line them up and look at them from a statistical standpoint, and you know, the most disadvantaged or lowest social person, you know, the, the person who's the slave dies first, then maybe the black person. But if it's a black person, the crew, the passenger will die first. And it just works its way up. And in disaster after disaster, this is the case. So here in Captain Pollard's boat, where the youngest one died, like it's, he may have drawn the short straw and that this exactly may be what's happened or not. And so what we've done is what we've, we've, we've presented quite straightforwardly Who's black, who's white, who's from the island, who's not from the island? Who lives, who dies? What do they say about it? And then we present a panel that raises those very questions. You know, There is the question to be asked. Why is it that the only non-Nantucketers who survive are the three who decide to stay on the island? And why do they decide to stay on the island? Like, is there something that they see happening? <laughs> I mean, I don't have an answer to that. And I wouldn't say for certain one way or the other. But the question is definitely there to be raised um, and, is, and is, exists in a historical context of other wrecks and other disasters. I mean, this is a pretty horrific thing. You know, they starve in boats for three months, three months. And, but they're not alone among sailors in encountering these kinds of situations. There are really horrible stories of people washed up on Greenland or in, you know, northern Canada or in the Arctic. You know, just horrible stuff that happens. You know, that's similar to this. And other boat, and there's lots of stories like this we just don't know about because the people aren't picked up, they don't survive. Um, and these things happen. I mean, the, one of the interesting things, and there's, there's a good book written about this, is you know, everybody acknowledged that cannibalism had happened. They came home and they were honest about it. And that was true for sailors until the 1880s and 90s. And in eight, the 1880s, there was a case where a yacht, British yacht, um, came to grief and they murdered and ate the youngest crew member. And when they were rescued and brought back to Plymouth, England, um, the captain admitted it. Yeah, you know, it was horrible. We got in this bad situation. This is what happened. And they were arrested and put on trial. And it was the first time that that had ever happened. Well, no, that's not exactly true. Other people had been arrested and put on trial and then acquitted because the circumstances were dire and that was sort of what happened at sea. And in the 1880s, that started to shift. Certain mores, certain land-based values and sea-based values came into conflict. And after the 1890s, nobody's talking about it anymore. Nobody says, we ate one of our crewmates. They're just like, oh, it was horrible, he died. And that's it. And, and there are some other accounts. There's some from World War I and World War II that are really great. But, you know, so those questions are definitely there. We ask the questions. We don't answer the questions because we don't feel we really can, can say for certain. Um, there, there's another uh, factor involved, and that is black men ended up on ships never really being able to afford to get off. So a steward might be a lot older mm -hmm. and not as uh, likely to survive. Do we know the ages of the black men who died? We know some of them. We've assembled in the show all of the ages we could figure out. Mm -hmm. The oldest crewman is about 60. Um, he is not, to our knowledge, one of the idlers. Um, the steward, we don't know his age. Mm -hmm. 
um, there is definitely that kind of consideration. Um, you know, whether differences in nutrition or in age and those kinds of things um, may have played into this as well. We, we've definitely assembled as much age, age information as we can. Unfortunately, for most of the African American crew, their biographical details don't, don't survive any of the documents that we have. So the question was, how long, how long should a visit, would a visitor's visit to our new exhibition take, to take all this in and, and, and absorb all this information? And my hope, and only you all will be able to confirm this for me, is that you ought to be able to walk in and out in five minutes and come away with some kernel of what we were hoping to achieve. And if you want to stay longer, you can lose yourself for an hour, hour and a half, reading all the details and taking a look at everything. So hopefully we've offered an experience that's flexible to meet your own stamina and your own interest. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. And I will disclose that I am a fellow crewman here at the NHA. Um, <laughs> but I, th there's a lot of theory that uh, all stories and all museum exhibits are in some way small p political, um, that they have some kind of uh, story to tell. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit in your research for this to how the Essex had been used in the past, what stories it had been used to tell by different historians, and maybe have you spoken already to the story you're trying to tell? Um, but yeah. Well, whatever historical stories we're telling in the present are always about our views of what's happening in the present. Um, I'm not quite sure what the Essex says about what's happening to us right now and why we're so interested in it, so I'm not going to wade into that territory. Um, I do know that some of the accounts of the Essex um, that are published come up at the very time in the 1880s when this, this, this uh, um, tragedy I told you about, where the men were put on trial, um, the Mignonette, um, which is probably not how they pronounced it, but how they should have pronounced the name of their ship, um, that, you know, there's an account of the Essex that comes up at that time of somebody saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're pillaring these men in this situation, but look what has happened in the past. Um, there are other accounts that appear in children's books. Um, the McGuffey Reader, the fourth McGuffey Reader, not the first one, so the more advanced students at the wealthier schools would have read about the Essex, um, you know, in the 19th century as a morality tale. Um, there are other books, uh, we have a quote in the show from the Child's Book of Wales, 1843, that frankly says they murdered their own and ate them, um, you know, because it served a sort of moral point, which isn't exactly a political point, which is your question, but definitely casting the story into sort of what, what, they, you know, what they wanted to say about it. Um, you know, different accounts in the 20th century have focused on, you know, let's write a biography of Chase, let's look at his family connections, let's really tell the story through Chase. Um, Henry Carlyle wrote the novelization of a, a fictional life of George Pollard. Again, sort of, you know, trying to correct or look at different aspects of these men's lives and, and work, on it, work on them that way. Um, you know, there are a lot of tellings of the story that are sort of boys' own adventure book kind of tellings. Um, we have one of those in the gallery. Um, and I don't know sort of what political purpose, I mean, I'm sure a historian of popular literature in the early 20th century would be able to tell me things about, you know, societal things going on and instabilities and you know, all the immigrants are coming and so the established people are feeling threatened so they look back in their history. I mean, there's those kinds of connections. We resurrect these stories and tell them in new ways in order to help give ourselves a grounding and an understanding of our times. And that's definitely happening with this story, but it happens as well with, with almost any story that's told. Um, certainly if you look at the Titanic and the story, the way the Titanic keeps being remade for different time periods, um, you know, the, what we look at that now is this nostalgic, you know, tragedy thing in the past. Very different from the way people in 1912 looked at it. Very different from, like, you know, looking at class issues and looking at, you know, um, you know the suffrage movement looking at that and saying, hey, wait a minute, if, you know. And so the, there are definitely currents of this in it. We hint at this in the exhibition, but we don't have, really have a lot of space to really tease a lot of that out. Um, and those kinds of issues often are very difficult in an exhibition setting where you want to have objects telling your story instead of just a lot of exposition. Um, I have a bit of exposition, but hopefully not too much. <laughs>